We're down in Devon in a sleepy village, about an hour from where I grew up. And just off the main street in the village is a house with a good shed at the back, it's sort of a barn. And inside that barn is, I'm gonna say this, the most valuable, exotic barn find car that I will have ever done to date. This is a true piece of archeology span here. And it's been in there a very long time and it actually looks from the photo that I've seen like it's probably been at the bottom of the sea, but it's that rare and that exotic and special. I had to come and take a look. So of course, this is a barn find edition of The Late Break Show. I'm Johnny Smith, and this episode is proudly supported by WD-40. So Patrick, or Paddy, you want to be called Paddy? Paddy works for me. Paddy, and I don't know the name of your dog. Rufus. Rufus, very, very, very well behaved dog. He's Got my boy. Tell us a bit about you, because I know that you're a bit of a car and motorbike person in general. Goodness, I got my first motorcycle, 50cc Yamaha at age 14, rode around the fields, worked my way up through bikes, became involved in sprint hill climb racing, uh, raced a 550 Suzuki extremely badly, uh, then raced a 750 Norton a bit more successfully. It was mid 80s, I moved up to the Thames Valley to work as a sidecar racing engineer, then went from there to the British Internal Combustion Engine Research Institute by CRI and Slough, Formula One, Formula 3000, Group C, um, all wow. that sort of stuff. Um, so you're an engineer? You're a race, that's a race engineer? Well, that was a dyno development engineer. Okay. Um, I then, where did I go? I then went to America and worked in, inverted commas, uh, an exotic motorcycle facility <laughs> full of Hollywood BS. Um, Envy Augustas and Laverdas and Ducatis and stuff like that. Then I came back to this country and went to work for PI Research, who made onboard data acquisition systems for Formula One cars. Yeah. I then went to Steve Parrish's locked out Yamaha team and uh, ran them there. Uh, Steve and I then went to the Isle of Man TT in 91. My gosh. On, yeah, 91. And we ran um, Robert, no, Terry Reimer and I'm trying to think who the riders were at that stage. You've done some uh, stuff. Uh, anyway. Paddy's done an awful lot of, of racing and R&D. <laughs> I mean, I, I, if, if we're allowed to show pictures, I'll show you what his, his, his little office room looks like because it's a proper Aladdin's cave of machinery. <laughs> but you're watching all of this thinking, this is a lot of motorcycle related stuff, but actually the thing in, in there is not motorcycle related at all. No. So what is in here? Well, downstairs there are two vehicles. Um, one of them is effectively a four-wheel motorcycle, as in it's got a tubular frame. That is a Ferrari Dino, 1972 Ferrari Dino. Uh, and the other is a 1959 Aston Martin DB4. Now, the significance of that particular car is it's car number 124, chassis number 124. Um, they started at car number 100, so that is the 24th DB4 ever made. So it's a very early car. It's almost unmolested from new. I don't think I'll talk about the previous owner, the original owner here, because we're going to go in and have a look. I'll tell you more about him. That, that is a whole story. I was going to say, the, I think the backstory of this guy is amazing. Can you, can you, Let's, can you open the doors? And I don't know if I can from outside. They're not so, designed to be open from outside. Just pull. Yep. Yuck. There we go. So. My, my paddy. I mean, two really cool cars. When you first sent the picture, I thought it looked like it had been like in a river. What's the story? The story is fascinating. In something like 1951, the chap who owned this car was taken to one side by his uncle, who is one of the major uh, shareholders of British American Tobacco. Right. And in 1951, he said to him, I want to leave a bequest to your two kids. So the chap in 1951 wrote a cheque for a million pounds. What? A million pounds in 1951. Imagine what that's worth today. So he said, jolly good, I'll invest that for my children. And the moment the guy was gone, he was like, yay! He bought an Aston, he bought a 1934 one-off Bentley, he bought an aeroplane, a sailing yacht, and he squandered the lot. And when he died, there was not one penny left. Really? My mate, who I actually bought this off, his son, 
apart from his education, never saw a penny of that money. It was all gone. So his dad. The reason just... the car is so shockingly bad at the back, and I mean, who's ever seen a DB4 with a <laughs> tow bar on it? He was reversing this into the sea to launch his yacht. Oh my gosh. So from here forward, it's fine. But that bit there is shockingly bad. This car was bought in 1959, according to the Aston build sheet that I've got over there, by a gentleman called Captain Lemos. Captain Lemos was a member of the Greek resistance during the war. Somehow he was tied up, I believe, with OSS, which was a pre-runner to the CIA. So Captain Lemos was doing something for the Americans. Now, I don't know what, but when the war ended, the Americans gave him a liberty ship. This liberty ship belonged to Americans, was in the Eastern Mediterranean when the war ended, and for reasons not known to me, they gave him this liberty ship. So hang on a minute. In a way, the person that first owned this car was a bit of a spy. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So a real-life James Bond. Real-life James in Bond. In an Aston Martin that isn't a so, DB5. So he had this car. I don't know how long he owned it for. I believe until around 63. Yeah. When my mate's dad bought it. The car is completely standard, with the exception, firstly, of the awful gold paint on it. Yeah. It was originally peony red, and you can see it in places under the gold paint. I'll yeah, show you well, minute. when we pull it out, we'll have a better um, look. It has, I'm going to call it a factory sunroof, but it's not on the build sheet. When my mate's father had this car, in 1982, it was taken off the road. My mate Jonathan moved it into his garage, and it stayed there from 1982 to... Yeah, 2003, when right, I bought so it. So 20 years ago. 20 years. So You've had it 20 years. I tried to buy this car off my mate. He said to me, you can buy it if you leave it to my son in your will. And I said, what if I have a son who wants it? And he said, oh, OK. And seven years later, he phoned me up one day and said, you've always had first refusal on this. I've been offered X for it by a dealer. If you match that, it's yours. In the meantime, I bought this one because I realised I wasn't, well, I thought I wasn't going to get my hands on that one. So I bought this one. Dino, right-hand drive? Right-hand drive. Um, I bought it off a chap who was restoring another Dino, and he robbed a lot of the really nice bits off this one for that one. Yeah. When they made the Dino, they did it in such a way that the accountants overruled all the engineers. So some of the standards of build on it are shocking. Yeah. Sometime later, I found this on eBay in Bristol. Um, Apparently the last one Ferrari ever made. I suspect what he meant was it's from the last batch they ever made, but whatever, it's, it's a, a genuine Ferrari rear body shell. They call yeah. it a clip yeah, for reasons that's not right. known to me. Yes. Having bought that one, I then looked for a front and I found one in America, it was too expensive, and I got put onto one in Japan, which you can just about see in the dullness of oh, the yeah. far side. So of. you've got a front, a new front and rear end for yeah. this Dino. Yeah, but having put a lot of thought into it. That one's my pension. I don't have any other pension, so that's my pension. This one's a car I want to build. So yeah. I'm building that as an engineer's car. And um, the engine that it came with as standard, a V6 2.4, is actually a very weak engine. This is where this comes into play. So what we have here is a Borrego 118th scale Dino yeah. with a 458 Italia engine in it. Oh. So that is also from a 118th scale. Now, um, it, it, I did this tongue in cheek as much as anything, yeah. but in basic principle, it shows that firewall to rear axle center line is actually very similar because with the V6 being transversely mounted, it had an exhaust bank going forwards. Yes. So there's quite a lot of space in front of it. Yes. So I believe I can fit a 458 Italia engine in there. What a great idea. The whole point of it is not that I want a 458 engined Dino. The okay. point is I want to build a 458 engine Dino, and that is a very, very different thing. Let's take off some of this stuff, shall take we? Take some of this stuff off, shall we? Okay. I'm so glad you haven't disturbed it, because how long, so how long has it been here? It's been here since 2003. Sitting exactly as we see it? Yep. And it was in your friend's garage before that? Yep, since 1982. This is one of the wires from the... That's yeah. the spare, yeah. yeah well, it it's actually, it's listed on the build sheet, factory chrome rims. So underneath that, oh, it's, it's non-standard fitment. Oh. 
all sorts of horrible things that I didn't know were here. <laughs> we'll see if we can push it out because it's tight in that corner. We can't see the front end. Okay, should we go? So when? Yep, yeah, when? It does roll, which is really, really good. Oh, wow. Let's check, check the lines. Ooh, blimey. Are we, oh, wow, we are. That, that super Leggera carrozzeri touring body is really close to that cabinet. Straight. Keep going, keep going. Yeah. How are we doing? A bit more. Okay, let's leave it there for now. Paddy wants to have a look in the boot, because now we've got the car out. We're going to have a look round it bit by bit. And the boot's not been open in a while. Yes. Oh, does that stay out? Going to stay out, I it think. It will stay out. So, there's one brake caliper. Yeah. I don't know where so that's why, that's why we pushed it out more easily, because you took the calipers off yep. 20 years ago. So this is where all the, you think this is where the majority of the corrosion is. Oh my word, yeah. yeah. Okay, so the spare wheel wells. Yeah. A bit, a bit frilly. Okay, let's see what the colour looks like. Oh my gosh. Okay, two very vivid colours which were not immediately clear. So that red is what it was. The factory colour, yep. And the gold is the... The horrible, nasty, <laughs> gold fingery, horrible <laughs> thing on it. Gold fingery. We're having problems opening this door. Uh, Paddy's been inside lubing the mechanism on the interior handle and, and we've, oh, we've got, some, we've got some rust being, and it's really stiff on these hinges. I'm wondering, Paddy, if, yeah, I'll get in there and... if you do the hinges, because yeah. I don't want to damage this bodywork. Oh, I can feel it easing. The dash looks in really good condition, yeah. Well, the clock there is the non-standard bit. The rest is, as far as I know, all in original. Yeah. So the, the outer door skin is aluminium. Yes. But the obviously inner carcass of the door is what's just left it's the fallen building. on the floor, It's just yeah. left the building here. And yeah. a bit of the trim panel, because this is all... This is all absolutely and gone. And the, the headlining's drooped at the rear. Well, how, you yeah. know, that, that, um, that kind of Wabasto-style fabric top looks all right you know it's it's held yeah and uh these you know, are interesting yeah i remember those tinted perspex sun visors they're ace and the rear view mirror has decided to fall, fall down. off yeah as you'd expect yep. this is one of those moments where i wish cars could talk yeah you were absolutely right about the back end being rotten and the front end actually being you know looking at this like um front valance and everything surprisingly good yeah mm -hmm. look at this look at this you so let's too, we, we must have a look at the uh, right. You want to have a look under the, there? The yeah? big six. I would love to have a look because I know. Right, let's get a prop because the I do know that the bonnet catch doesn't work. It doesn't weigh very much. So it's no, it doesn't, deal. does it? I thought it was going to be. Uh, I've just got to find somewhere to prop it onto. The DB4 was the first production car to do a zero to one hundred miles an hour to zero in under thirty seconds. I didn't know that. And it would do zero to 100 miles an hour in 21 seconds at the time. That was rocket, you know. It's Engine number? Yeah. 119. 119. If you come around here. Yeah. You've got the best torch in the world by the look of it. Yeah. You see down there? Just where my finger is. Yeah, yeah. 370 slash 119. Yeah, 370 means 3.7 litre. Yeah. 119. So that's the right engine for this car. The chassis number is stamped on that rail down under there and you've got to get under the car to see it. I don't suggest we try that yet. <laughs> yeah, maybe in a bit. So it is a numbers matching car. It is a numbers matching car, yeah. B4 
but you have not played with this since I you bought it. I haven't even attempted to turn the engine over. So we don't know if it's seized? Nope. Are you happy for us to have a little tickle today? I just... can be rude not to. Good, I, I was hoping you'd say that. You've driven a long way. <laughs> You've driven a long way to have a look at it. Let us find out. So the first thing we're going to do with this um, glorious engine, I suppose, is check whether it's been seized. Yeah. So try and see if we can turn it over, probably get the plugs out. Yep. Um, I've I noticed... recommend we do this first. I was going to say, give it, give it a good hosing of penetrating oil down there. Being a double overhead cam, the plugs live in the, the valley between the two cams. I can see daylight down there. I can see daylight through that, through there. So, and there's, that there is the mechanism, which is the obviously mechanism, yeah. it's rotted off from where it, it would should have. It should be tinware going right across here. And, and it's gone. And it, now it's all cornflakes down there. Yeah. Which, and, and you were saying it hasn't been outside since 82. No. Which means all the little sycamore helicopters that I can see down here will put their pre-82. Yep. It helps that you've got an enormous bar, <laughs> I think. You know, that resistance is futile, but you, what you don't want to do is strip. I've got a plasma cutter around the corner, so, you know, the mechanical things often take that into account. That's, a, that, that's that that's squeaking, that's what it is. Oh, let's, let's deal with that. You need, you, need to, you need to lube up your tools, Paddy. What I like about you is the fact that even if I was to bring all of the tools that I own, I'd probably have about a twentieth of the tools that you've got here. You haven't seen half of them yet. Oh my gosh. So you were saying that the, all the bolts that you removed on the rear calipers and stuff were like greased. Yep. And everything came off nicely. Straight away, yep. So the chances of, of the engine being, I mean, I know it's sat for an enormous amount of time, but that, I mean, all of, what, four, five plugs five came, so came far, loose yeah. really easily, which is really good for us. Never worked on an Aston before, have you? No, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely, I'm definitely being cautious. These ones should be all right. I'm very... Okay, the rogue plug. And that hasn't taken the thread with it? No, I don't think it has. Let's see how bad it is. A bit of WD has seen it right. Yeah, looks foul down there. Does it? I was going to say, is that the worst one? Yeah. Have you got, I don't suppose you've got a vacuum cleaner, have you? Yeah, if we put that onto there and take that. Yeah. And get some. I was not expecting to start modifying vacuum cleaners. No, next it's to an not, Aston not my normal predilection. But the reason why we're doing this, just in case you're a bit confused, is once we've taken the spark plugs out of, of, the, of the hole there, the combustion chamber, you don't want any crud, especially metallic bits, to fall down there because they'll they could get stuck in the engine, they could damage it. And at the moment, we don't know if it's seized. So we'll, we'll vacuum all the debris out, then we'll spray some penetrating oil down the bore holes, and then we'll hopefully get um, a socket on the, um, the, the crankshaft pulley at the end there to see if we can move the engine to and fro with no compression in it, because we've obviously taken the plugs out. Should we commence the suckage? Do you want to tread on that one? Yeah. Patient. There's still some debris down there. That's a lot better than what it was. So we've now got the, we've got the WD-40 penetrating oil in all the bores. Let them sit for a while while we look at the, the pulleys on the front. So this where the fan is, that's the water pump. Presumably there's no water in it, it's no. probably fallen out somewhere. I don't know if he drained it out or whether it was it now. fell out. Probably fell out of the bottom of the radiator, which I... What's this like then? It's solid. Shall we um, give yeah. it the treatment? Yeah, that, so, so that pulley's solid, but that doesn't mean it's seized. It means the water pump is seized, which is pretty common. So what we could do, depending on what the others are like, so is that the dynamo? Yeah. That's the dynamo down there, and that's probably... See, so solid too. Yeah. I can tell that, because I'm just but, literally doing that. But what we could do... Is, yeah, cut the, cut the fan we belt. Could, should we cut the fan belt off because it's a sacrificial maintenance item? That turned. That did turn. Yeah, yeah that's just moved. 
So is, was the dynamo moving at that time? No, the fan belt didn't turn. Okay. I'm just seeing if... So that is moving and the belt is it's not moving. It's getting better all the time, isn't it? Yeah. So now we need to see if we can get, um, get something on that lower pulley if we can. Just a quick recap. We've broken for lunch. It's too hot for the fleece, hence why it's off. And Paddy thinks that we should take the radiator out so we can get access to the lower, um, the crankshaft pulley to turn the engine over or see if it turns over and, and see if it's not seized. If it's not seized, we'll continue to work through the rest like ignition and fuel system. But that really is the big decider on whether we have any hope of firing up a DB4 today. Even saying that sounds freaky. Never thought I'd be playing around with a, a car like this. We've got, a, we've got an incident. So it did have water in the rad mm. and it doesn't look that grim. Does it? No. That water looks spookily good. I can't believe that. I really thought it was going to be as dry as a bone. Yeah, me too. Well, All there right. we go. So sorry about your workshop floor. Oh, say la vie. That's what it's there for, isn't it? I think maybe well, those that, bolts that. need to be drifted out. Uh, okay. So should we, uh, if only you had there a hammer. Yes, if only I had a hammer. I mean, you've got a few over in that corner, I think. Have yeah, that one there. Well, it's, I mean, what, what, what is it today? It's, it's Tuesday. What's your Tuesday hammer? This one. Okay. This is my Tuesday All hammer. All right. That doesn't sound very good, does no. it? No. No. It's very solid. That is not moving. I don't understand why this is so solid. No. And then, uh, no. Oh. There Have you just bloody pulled it? Yeah. It's, oh, it's that strength that we were talking about <laughs> earlier. Yeah. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. So, right. so, do you want a hand? Yeah. Just watch out on this air. Oh, hang on. Just. Oh, yeah, water. I'm very surprised. And there's still, there's still stuff in. Yeah. Still liquid held in it, which, it, which bodes well. Now that the rad's out, you can see how much room we've got to put a, a bar and a socket on that pulley there. There we go. And look at that. Okay. Isn't that Bloody just hell. unbelievable? Unbelievable. I really, if I was honest, I was thinking today, looking at the car, that's probably going to be seized. But just you goes to show. You and me both. Yeah. Yeah. Look what I've just noticed amongst all this rubble. It's detritus. Oh, bollo <laughs> bollocks. Hang on, I'll go and get the other bit. It's, it's just, it's crumbled to dust. That is the, on that top panel, yeah, the yes. round panel, is, the, is that the VIN? No. Or is that the... I can tell you that's not the VIN. Because you have it. Because that's the VIN that I rescued off there some time ago. Oh, wow. So that used to be on this panel yes. too? Yes. That's amazing. There we go. Felton Middlesex. Yeah. Chassis and engine number and... Chassis engine number reverse. 119, DB4, 124, R. We've just taken off the distributor cap just to have a look at the condition of the, um, the rotor arm and the contact points. And they look amazing. Like the rotor arm looks new. It's remarkable. So you think that you're happy with that? In there? I mean, we haven't checked the points, have we yet? I just had a look at them. The, the faces are absolutely like the rotor arm. I reckon it's all brand new. Really? Yeah. That's freaky. Yeah, there's they, no, no corrosion. They've been sat there almost as long as I've been alive. Yeah. And they're, they're way better looking than me. <laughs> okay, well then we'll stick, I wouldn't want to argue with we'll stick some oil, we're going to stick some oil in, we have found some correct oil um, and we're going to, then we'll get the oil back up to the, to the correct spot on the dipstick and then, well, we'll scratch our heads. Well, what, what would you do next? What, I mean, I would suggest to dis definitely disconnect the fuel, obviously, before any, any old sediment gets pulled in and I would probably see if you can attach a battery and, and over there, I think there's a sip. bottle with a pipe on it. We can oh. put some fuel in. Oh, I've got, I've got one of those. Have you? Right. Oh, Paddy, I've got one of those. It's not a bottle. Oh, no, you've got a proper tank then. Oh, I've got a... Yeah, 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 I don't like to burst. Right, that's half, at least half has gone in there.
quick recap. Uh, Paddy has put new battery terminals on it because they were crusty and horrible. I've put the battery on. We've put the key and turned the key and the lights have all come on. Even the clock works, the retrofitted clock. So now I think we are at a point where we can go for a turn on the key, assuming it will turn on the key. Say when. So should we do it? Here we go. Yeah. What's, what's that? Is that turning over? That's turning over. Fabulous. And, and I'll do it again. Keep yeah. your fingers clear. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> that is, I'm getting big blows of air out of the boreholes. Oh, suits me, sir. Yeah, that's, that's quite smooth. That's pretty impressive, isn't it? Right. You I'm weren't gonna... expecting that either. Oh, no, I wasn't. No. Right, bit of a recap. We, we, we're so close. We are not getting a spark. And we've got these weird extra connectors that were floating around near the coil onto these spade connectors on the coil, which we haven't, none of us had noticed up until now because we've been concentrating on everything else. So, and this is household flex, which did, should not be there. Yeah, this is household cable, which is obviously not original Aston Martin. It goes back along here and it goes into this box, which had a label on it at some point, and it's all just flaked and fallen into dust. So we think it could be like a, an aftermarket amplifier, spark amplifier, but it's not clear whether this was disconnected because it wasn't working, whether someone's taken it off in the past, whether it had a problem. And this is the bit where you, you scratch your chin a bit. Luckily, Paddy knows a bit about electronics. Oh, look at that, there's a wire there with, it's broken off. That one there. Um, I don't know what this is. And it was hanging around in midair. That's hanging around in midair. I've just cut this wire off here, which leads off to that box. And my plan was to connect that one onto that one there and see if we can get something going. I mean, the, that connector there is absolutely dire. All the connectors are not great, are they? No. But you'd, um, still, you'd still get a weak spark, you'd think, if it was correct. And at the moment, we're not getting any spark at all. We haven't had any spark. The engine's turning over freely. That's the irritating thing. I don't think we're gonna get any further today with what we have here. Yeah. Like you said, I don't think we're very far off it. No. My thought is that that ignition coil needs to come off and be tested. Yeah. And potentially the dis distributor taken apart and cleaned. Yeah. But probably not. I think it's probably just the coil and probably just the wiring supply to the coil. Yeah. Um, your call really is how much longer do you want to put into it today? And potentially, do you want to come back tomorrow? Interesting question. This is actually the next day because on day one, and we normally only spend a day on, on barn finds, we can't really justify doing multiple days, sadly. Um, we couldn't get the car to spark and thus didn't bother trying to introduce fuel. But as we left, Paddy said, I'm gonna carry on and do a few things. And that coincided with the, the filming that we were supposed to be doing today, the shoot we were supposed to be doing today, Phil behind the camera and me, has been canceled. So we thought, maybe we'll come back and that's what we're doing. So what have you done in the last 12 hours, Paddy? Well, as you can tell, I've been busy. Yeah. One of the problems we had was, as you say, no spark. The problem with that was that we have an ignition coil there where the fitting, which is now white, the yeah. fitting was made of a Bakelite-y, plasticky type thing and it crumbled as we tried to work on it yesterday. I got in the lathe last night and I machined up a new one of these. That's industrial <laughs> nylon. It's a half inch BSF thread, very unusual, um, but that's done, uh, soldered at the end over, and so that now appears to be good and solid. Good and solid, good connection. I then went into the dizzy and did an electrical resistance test across the contact points and discovered to my horror that even when they were closed, there was no contact. They weren't contact. So we had no chance of getting a spark between that and that. Yeah. So I then spent about an hour sitting there refitting and stripping out again the damn contacts until I actually got a good electrical connection. I also made up a new sub 
Hantner, I can't call it sub harness. I repaired well, the original system, so hopefully we've now got power going to the places where it needs to be and it's got good contacts. Yeah. I then went through and uh, checked out the firing order of the plugs and labelled all the leads so we know the plugs are going in the right, going in the right holes. I've <laughs> put here molly, molly grease on each of the threads so that when they go in they'll be seated nicely. Yeah. So that hopefully will give us an ignition system. That is brilliant. You notice also... Oh, you've put the rad back in. The rad's gone back in. Yeah. So um, I emptied it out, um, refitted it, and filled it with coolant with antifreeze in. Um, and it's not leaking? Nothing's come out yet. Really? That is amazing. <laughs> much, to my, much to my surprise. Or at least I haven't heard anything come out. <laughs> I haven't climbed under with a torch to check. Um, and so I've pulled the air filters off. Great. And you notice between them, this box... Oh yes, the old weird box. We didn't know what it was. So I pulled it off, partly because I needed access to the carbs and it was in the way. Yeah. But that appears to be a very primitive ignition amplifier. So we've taken the um we've taken all the blue roll out of the um spark plug holes because you don't want it to suck them in when we turn it over. Let's give it a go. Nothing. No. Not helpful. That isn't. So still no spark. So, so I wonder if it's the wire from from here, this wire here, running through the back here, whether that's faulty. Well, I can't see it. It doesn't. Mm. The coil works. We're getting input into the coil. We're getting output from the coil. We're getting a spark at the points when we have the distributor cap off but it seems like that nothing is being passed onto the plugs. Which is a bit odd, because the rotor arm's in good condition, the cap looks in good condition, the leads look in good condition, the plugs have been cleaned up. So you think it's the points? Well, there's two possibilities. One is that that isn't contacting in there. Yeah. And I can't test it. Well, I could, I suppose, if I arranged that cleverly. And I get a lead on there somehow. Yeah. Right, nothing going on there. So it's either that contact in there is not working, yeah. or this here isn't reaching isn't down far is, enough. Isn't seating on the... We are having a problem still. We seem to have a spark coming out of the coil if we bypass, if we just take a, a feed straight off it. So we're getting power into the coil, we're getting power out of the coil. We're getting a flash of spark at the points is that right, Paddy? Yeah. But we're not getting any sparks from the plugs, whether we replace the plugs, whether we leave them as they were. That coil's in such a difficult place to get at, you can't see into it to see what's going on. If we took the bonnet off, we, we could, but it's all rusted up and that'll be a bit of a yeah. struggle. Um, Go make a cup of tea and... We did stop for a cuppa. And we did try again using various different techniques, but nothing would make the Aston produce a spark. So I went home empty-handed. But a couple of days later, having ordered a plethora of new ignition parts, Paddy had success. Have a listen to this. Wasn't it great? Great to hear that DB4. Well, I'm now going to put you back to me saying goodbye on the day that we didn't get the car running. Here we go. Thank you so much for watching this episode of the show. And thanks to Paddy um, and to Phil, his friend, uh, for letting me come and have a look at this car because what an amazing, an amazing rare opportunity to touch a DB4 that's been pulled out from that corner for 30 years. 40 years? Yeah. Well, 20 years here, 20 years at the other place. Yeah, 40 yeah. years. So, I mean, and so, yeah, I'm going to say that now, unless by some miracle we manage to fire it up and we can put that into the edit. Um, but, yeah, it's been wonderful. If you have a car, it might not be an Aston Martin DB4, the chances are it won't. 
in a hedge, on a drive, in a real barn or in a garage that you think might be interesting for me to come and look at, let me know. Uh, there's a link in the description with an email. Email us, tell us where you are, send us some pictures if you've got any and if there's an interesting story. Thanks a lot.